Let's go through a little bit of a summary over some of the things we've learned and talked about. And then the meat of what we're going to talk about today is about the first kind of giving. So if you're taking notes, and I hope you are, why do we want you to take notes? Because it makes me feel important, right? No, it, we want you to take notes because you're going to remember better the things that we talk about if you take some notes. So if you're taking notes, just write down that we are going to be talking about the first kind of giving. All right, so first let's go through a summary of some of the things that we've learned and talked about in these scripture passages will kind of lead us through that. But one of the things we talked about was when it comes to talking about giving money to the church, there is probably no other area where people rise up and become instant theologians than in the area of giving money to the church. And over the years, I mean, you just can Google it and you'll find all kinds of people who've never darkened the door of a church or rarely uh, park themselves in a pew who have uh, generously shared with us all kinds of theological understandings about why you should not give to your local church, why you should not uh, give money to a church or a, a religious organization of any kind. So instantly it creates uh, that kind of a situation in our society. Um, and and, it's, and it primarily has to do with the fact that money is very, very personal. Now at your Thanksgiving tables, there were three big subject matters that you tried to keep off the table. If you have family from different walks of life and different belief systems, you tried to keep religion uh, off of the table. You tried to keep politics off the table. And we all kind of naturally know to keep money off the table. We don't talk about our finances. We don't talk about our religion. We don't talk about our politics, uh, by and large, because those are things that can kind of cause people to get very upset. So we've kind of left it to the poets, if you will, of our society to kind of lightly stroke those ideas and talk about those things in ways that are politically correct, in ways that are more friendly. And so with uh, our great poets, they are able to say things that have little zingers to them. And we think they're talking about religion. We think they're talking about money. We think they're talking about politics. But they also could be talking about various other things. And we, we will quote those. We'll make little memes out of them. And we think that's just amazing. Now, those poets of our society were called right, to, to make us feel comforted, to make us feel comfortable. They've come to, if you will, comfort the afflicted. All of the poets have come to comfort the afflicted. Now, Jesus came to afflict the comfortable. <laughs> All right, he came to shake things up. So Jesus talked a lot about religion. Jesus talked a lot about politics. And Jesus talked a lot about your money. And he has a lot to say about it because he was all about shaking the planet. He was all about shaking up our understanding and getting us to understand how God views everything and how he wants to help us to understand uh, these things as well. So Jesus came to, to, to make us somewhat uncomfortable, if we will. He had a lot to say about our money. And uh, the Bible has a lot to say about your finances. Now, in 34 years of marriage, Michelle and I have practiced tithing faithfully. And uh, it has been such a tremendous blessing. In fact, it's to the point for us that it's not even really anything that we think about. You know, uh, we, we don't even put, uh, you know, a lot of thought ahead into it. It's just automatic for us, just like a direct deposit or something. We know that, that we have been blessed by God and that everything that's come into our hands is not for us. And remember, we understand also what we talked about this month, that God doesn't necessarily want something from us. He wants something for us. And so through our, our giving, God is, is going to op there's open up opportunities for us to be a blessing and to do many things that we could not do if we were trying to see everything and hoard everything up as if it just belonged to us. So we have done it naturally. Many of you may have been raised that way and you've, you've felt that way as well. For others of you, it's a real challenge. I told you the story about how Amanda, when we uh, took the giving banks and we, you know, when she was real little, she was well, 9, 10, whatever, uh, and we were explaining to her, you know, we'd broken the $10 bill up into dollars. You know, you're going to put a dollar, there was these, these three in one banks. Uh, and uh, so I showed you one of those uh, a couple of Sundays ago, but for those of you who didn't see it, it's, it's kind of one 
piece of plastic, but it's three in one banks, and you had uh, one that was labeled bank, like a, and it looked like a bank, and one that was labeled church, and then one that was labeled store. And so we told her, you put $8 in the store, that's the money you can get out and spend and go buy what you think you want or need, you know? And you're gonna put $1 in the church, because that's tithe, that's what God's asked, and then you're going to put $1 in the bank, because that's savings, you need to save and be prepared, because you never know what might be ahead for you. So we were teaching our kids how to do this early on in their life, and her struggle with that, and it helped me, you know, kind of remember that if we don't get over that struggle when it's $10, we think that's huge when it's $100 or $1,000, right? It's a big, big struggle then because 10, you know, a dollar out of 10 doesn't seem so huge, but 10 out of 100, you know, or 100 out of 1,000 seems like a lot of money. And so we were trying to get them prepared early, and we hope that you will be doing the same with your kids about teaching them the principles of good stewardship. Now, each time that um, you know a, a huge need has arrived in our lives, God has always provided for us. And it just a simple drive around the city for me reminds me of God's faithfulness. Now, when we first moved here, uh, I didn't have a full-time job for a good season while we were first here. And many of you know how challenging that can be because uh, prior to that, I had been the main breadwinner. And so we were in a place where we were kind of struggling. You know, I mean, things were really, really tight. And we made some decisions, maybe in some cases that we shouldn't have made, to cut expenses back in various areas and get things down to the bone as quick as possible, as much as possible. And so we were living on a very tight budget. We didn't have that expectation. I thought I would immediately be able to get a full-time position uh, when we first moved here. So this long season. So when I drive by 620 and I'm heading down past, uh, some of you know where the school tax office is, I have a memory there uh, that is fresh to me about God's faithfulness for us. Uh, what happened was this long season of not having um, employment put us behind towards tax season and when we needed to pay the taxes for school tax the money was not there and so we were praying about it two months out before that bill was due and um, so uh, I had an opportunity to show a home to a couple and we saw 12 different houses they liked the 12th one and uh, so they wanted to purchase the 12th one. I was representing them. And so we got an accepted contract and here we go. You know, we're on our, on our way and I'm excited, but we're, there's still a shortfall. About a week into that deal, I get a call from the agent. He said, you know, I don't know if you knew this, but you probably didn't because it wasn't in the contract uh, that we put together and everything. But there is a bonus on this property and it goes to the seller's agent, and that's you, uh, that the bank is paying. And so just wanted to let you know, heads up. And he told me what the amount was. Boom, right to the dollar of what I was going to need to carry down. Literally closed on that property, uh, took the check, uh, cashed it, and went straight to that place on 620, uh, just off 620, and went in there and waited in line and took that cash and laid it on the desk. And it always reminds me of the faithfulness of God. But I have to tell you, not one time during that difficult season or any other difficult season in our lives, have Michelle and I sit around going, man, I wish we had some of that tithe back, you know, <laughs> that we'd given away. Man, you know, I was just starting to calculate it in my head. And I was thinking, if we just had that, because there was no way we could ever outgive God. And he has always been faithful in our lives. So just revisiting with you some of the principles, the things that we had talked about and the amazing things that God has done and reminding you of some of those stories. Some of you have stories as well of the faithfulness of God. But this morning, have you ever wanted a gift that money couldn't buy? We all go out and buy presents. We're going to be filling the underneath of that tree with all kinds of presents as we move towards Christmas. But all of us, there's a gift that we want that will not fit underneath that tree. Every one of us want this, every one of us need it, but it doesn't really fit under the tree. Up to this point, you know, I thought, uh, uh, you know, uh, when I was talking to a, uh, getting ready to write a book, and I was talking to 
uh, a, a person who has published successfully some books just to get some input, friend of mine. And uh, very discouraging news because uh, he immediately told me, if you want to write a bad book, then make yourself uh, the subject of that book. <laughs> and I started thinking about it prior to him saying that. I thought I was a pretty interesting person. So um, I said, man, I wish I'd talked to you before I wrote four chapters about me. Because now <laughs> there's a lot of editing that needs to happen in my book. But I understand what he was saying, and there's a larger principle in, in that for all of us to learn. You know, and that is that you know, we need to understand in many cases that we are the heroes of our books. We write our own books, and the books are all about us. We're the heroes, we're the protagonists, and all of the, the characters in our book and in our life uh, centered around us uh, you know, as, uh, and feature us, and it's all about us. And so there's no wonder that we go into financial uh, living thinking that everything that comes into our hands is about us. It's for us. It, we got it. It came to us. It had my name on it. didn't have anybody else's name on it. So it should be for me. And so we don't have that kind of thinking that God may actually put something in our hands that he intends for us to pass on to someone else, right? So our thinking is that everything is about us. And as I was listening to this author, I was thinking, yeah, you know, I've written a lot about me in my book of life. And we need to be thinking differently. And God wants to help us think differently. And some of what we're going to talk about today is going to free that up for us. It's going to help us understand uh, things differently. Let's go quickly through a review of some of the principles that we talked about regarding uh, giving and being faithful in our giving. Uh, out of uh, Leviticus chapter 27, verse 30, a tithe of everything from land, whether grain from the soil, fruit from the trees, belongs to the Lord. It is holy unto the Lord. And with these words, God calls us to focus on the fact that that central to our problem with money is that we don't understand ownership in this world. We don't understand that we don't really own anything. I was doing some writing, reflective essay that I required writing that I need to do. And, and, um, and in that, I was writing about my first funeral. I remember my first funeral. And I was given the role because I was one of the pastors on staff, and I did not know these people. In fact, they didn't go to our church, and nobody really knew them. It just fell my lot. It was my turn, and it was my, uh, <laughs> I was supposed to do it. So I remember going down to the funeral home and meeting these people and getting there an hour and a half or so early and trying to find out something about this person who I was going to give a service for. And I had kind of a, a message put together and trying to pencil in some notes about this individual. And, and I'm really recalling and thinking back through, you know, uh, how uh, this, this situation was such a, uh, a struggle, such a, such a difficulty for me to, to walk into a situation with a, with a total stranger. But as I'm looking at this family and I'm looking at this situation and doing this funeral, I'm realizing this guy who had some things in life is taking nothing with him. There's nothing with him. And at the close of that funeral, when they were getting ready to close the casket, they were asking uh, the wife and the kids if they wanted the watch, the ring, the things that, that he had were personal to him, something that would be a memory to them. And I literally remember that this feeling that this man has is, is, is been stripped of all possessions and is leaving this life with nothing just as he came into life with. And so the understanding about ownership is something that we struggle with. And Psalms 24 verse 1 says, The Lord, uh, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. It is all God's and you and I are stewards of what belongs to him for whatever season that we're on this planet. We are just stewards of that. We get to watch over it. And so in Malachi chapter 3 verse 10 Setting things in perspective, God says, everything belongs to me. Here's what I want you to do. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that they may have food in my house. That word tithe we talked about over the course of the month, which means 10%. And the people were asked to bring that into the storehouse. Now, one of the reasons that Michelle and I have been faithful in our giving, and we've done it in our local and home church, 
is because that's where we eat. That's where we bring our family spiritually to get food and to eat. And we want that to be a place that is prepared. We want it to be nice. We want it to have the equipment, to have the lights, to have air conditioning. I really appreciate the air conditioning in uh, these uh, hot areas that we live in, in the southern part uh, of the state. And, you know, we're grateful that we have the opportunity to provide and to help out where our family is going to be spiritually fed and taken care of, and other families as well. And so we've always done that, we will always do that, and it's not an issue for us. Deuteronomy chapter 14, verse 23, tells us about the purpose of tithing, and this is why we wanted to teach it to our kids, because it teaches us to put God first. Look at these words and read along with me. The purpose of tithing, let's do it together, ready? The purpose of tithing is to teach you always to put God first in your lives. Our money is following our heart, and we're taught this throughout Scripture. We love uh, this church, we love this, the people, we love this community, and so we want, uh, our heart loves, uh, and we want everyone to see that the finances are following what we love and what we care about, what we're passionate about, what we believe that God has called us to and to be a part of. And so when we get, you know, part of like getting this into proper perspective is answering this question. Have you ever wanted a gift that money could not buy? Because the real struggle for us with our wallets, with talking about money, with being generous in terms of following God's principles of stewardship, is that we need to receive the first gift that is offered from God, and we need to be giving that first gift away. And that first gift has nothing to do with your wallet. It has to do with your heart. And here's what it says in Luke chapter 6, verse 37. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. The very first kind of giving was God giving to us, His Son. In propitiation, that theological word. In our place, to take our place. So that you and I don't end up paying the full consequence for our sin, but we can make Him the leader and the Lord of our lives, and we can accept what he has already accomplished for us, and we don't have to pay back. We don't have to try to do ten goods for one bad. Because he has paid the price. He has taken care of it on our behalf. And so for you and I, the very first kind of giving that we received was forgiveness from him. And he's saying to us, as a result of that, we have a responsibility. Ephesians chapter uh, 4 verse 32, be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as Christ forgave you. The gift that you want and I want that can't fit underneath the tree is only found in relationship with Christ Jesus. Someone in your life needs it from you just as you needed it from him. It could be your mom or your dad, it could be a sister or a brother, a relative, a friend, a co-worker, a, a neighbor, an ex-friend that deeply wounded you and you've written them off. Somebody in your life needs forgiveness and they're calling right now <laughs> and asking for that. <laughs> Luke chapter 6, verse 38, give and it shall be given unto you. Now listen, think about this verse from a different perspective. Think about it in terms of giving the first gift. Not giving out of your wallet, not giving uh, out of your finances, but giving forgiveness this way. Give and it shall be given unto you a good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be poured out into your lap with a measure that you use, it will be measured to you. We're talking about not your money, but we're talking about your heart. Now, before you can freely give your money, your tithe, your talent to the Lord, you need to be able to freely give forgiveness. You need to be able to receive forgiveness, and you need to be able to give forgiveness to others. It's the reason most of us struggle in financial areas, because we are also struggling with forgiveness. 
We are also struggling to let go of things that we've been harboring and holding on to. I read the story of Christy Jones recently, striking story, um, lovely young lady, and only, you know, eight years into her marriage, she received an email. And the email was, was brief, it was from somebody she didn't know, and it basically said, I know you don't know me, I've been in an affair with your husband for four months, I'm sorry for the pain that I've caused your family, I broke it off, and it's done. She was devastated. She picks up the phone and she calls her husband at work, and after confronting him and, and, and uh, talking to him, you know, extensively on the phone, he finally confesses and says, yes, for four months, I've had this relationship going on with a coworker. She talks about the process of forgiveness and how hard it was, but she said it was made somewhat easier because there was, there was, there was such a, a, a sorrow that overcame her husband, a, a repentance that overcame him, and, and, he, and he was so uh, stricken by uh, how he had wounded and hurt and what he had done, that it made it somewhat easier for her to be able to forgive. And she talks about the process of how God really began to heal her heart once she let go, and uh, she, she forgave that person, and she forgave her husband, and and, and she let go of this and how God brought healing in such to the point for her and her husband that a year later they, they re formally renewed their vows in front of family and friends and recommitted themselves to keep the vows that had been broken and, and, uh, and, and bring this marriage back together. And such a beautiful thing that God did. And in reflection she was asked and she said, you know, I've never regretted forgiving. It made all the difference in my life. I was watching, and maybe some of you have as well, the, the biography or story that was uh, Elizabeth Smart. Uh, those of you who are older will remember her story, captured at age 14, uh, kidnapped from her home and taken by um, these lunatics and, and uh, out into the desert. And she was severely treated, horribly treated, raped, and, and uh, treated awful by this, the, the, these, these almost non-humans. And um, so I, I was watching through this biography of her talking uh, through her story and with a, with a psychiatrist. And, I, and he had asked her at some point, you know, don't you, don't you hate these people, you know, when you think about them and what they did for you? And she says, no, I don't. I have forgiven them. I have let go of it. Because she said, they had nine months of my life, and I won't give them one more minute. Yeah. I won't give them one more minute. I, I, they're forgiven. She said, it might be harder if they were outside uh, prison, if they were free and roaming around to, to do harm to someone else, but you know they're 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 paying for what they did, and uh, they're where they belong. And I have, I will not hold it one more moment. I have a wonderful husband. I have two children, and my I'm not giving that 30 more seconds of my life. But how beautiful that is to our understanding of what forgiveness is really all about. The very first gift that God gave to you and I was forgiveness. And it was immeasurable. And it just keeps being spilled over into our lives. We do it again, and God forgives us again. We fall down again. We, we see ourselves in, in the mirror of His Word, and we see how dark places are in our life, and God just keeps spilling out forgiveness as we request and ask Him for forgiveness. He just keeps forgiving and forgiving and forgiving us. Over and over and over again, and then, again and again and again, He forgives us. And He's never held it over us, and He's never tried to get into a bargaining situation with us. All right, I'll forgive you one more time. That's it. But if you cross the line, you're done. He has just forgiven us and, and poured out His mercy and poured out His grace and spilled it out over into our lives. Mark chapter 11, verse 25 says, And when you stand praying... When you learn about a God that it just keeps forgiving and forgiving and forgiving, doesn't it make you want to give to a God like that? Give your time, your talent, your treasure to a God who forgives and loves you and sees exactly who you are better than anybody in your life because he sees to the very darkest moments. Even our spouses don't see certain things about us that God is able to see and yet he loves us and pours out his mercy. And yet he cautions us don't give 
in this passage, because he says, when you see, uh, when you stand praying, if you hold anything against anyone, forgive them so that your father may forgive you of your sins. Before you start functioning in obedience to me, do what I did for you, and that is forgive people that are around your life. That is your first action, is an action of obedience to me is to forgive. The underbelly of Christianity, we've been forgiven, but do we forgive? I want to talk to you in closing about the message of Christianity is uh, what forgiveness is not, because it, we talked a lot about what forgiveness is over the course of this past year. I want to, to help you understand what it is not and give us a real clear perspective. Forgiveness is not conditional. Forgiveness is not conditional. In other words, it's not based on somebody else's response. Real forgiveness is unconditional. It is not earned. It is not deserved. It is not bargained for. It is not paid for. It is based on... Uh, it's not based on some kind of a promise that you're never going to do something again. And if, if you say to someone, I'll forgive you if, that's not forgiveness, that's bargaining. All right? The second thing that forgiveness is not, forgiveness is not minimizing the seriousness of the offense. I'm really sorry I did that, but you did this and this and this, and that made me do that, right? And the, so forgiveness is not minimizing the seriousness of the offense. There's, there's a big difference between being wounded and being wronged, okay? Being wounded is something that's, that's accidental and it does not require forgiveness. Somebody overlooked you. Somebody forgot about something that, you know, somebody did something that, that hurt you, but they weren't purposeful in that action. They were... Uh, you know, maybe oblivious. They may, they, perhaps they should have been a little more, um, you know, thinking about that in the forefront of their mind. But it was an accident. It wasn't a purposeful thing. We have accidents on the freeway. You know, we don't get out of our car and beat the other person senseless saying, you, you purposely took your car and ran over me. You know, we call it what the insurance company calls it, an accident, right? Boom, you know, we hit each other. Uh, there was an accident, and we're, you know, we're willing to forgive them as soon as their insurance company pays up, right? And <laughs> we're hoping they'll forgive us if it's us the next time, right? But that's an accident, okay? So that does not require forgiveness. But when you are wronged by someone intentionally, and they meant to hurt you, that requires forgiveness, Okay? They are purposefully doing something that is going to damage and hurt you. And that requires forgiveness. The third thing, forgiveness is not a relationship without changes. Forgiveness is not getting back into a relationship without any changes. The Bible teaches that forgiveness and restoring relationships are two very different kinds of things, right? Right? So forgiveness is instant. It's like you're forgiven. I'm, you know, I'm not going to hold this against you. I'm not going to think about it anymore. I'm not going to dwell on it. I forgive you. And, you know, uh, I, I know God's forgiven you and we're moving forward. All right. So forgiveness is instant. But trust when we're rebuilding a relationship must build over a long period of time. And this is where there's a hang up. You know, sometimes people think, well, you, you forgave me, you know. So why can't I get back into that intimate circle that I was in before? Because you violated it. <laughs> and you need to work your way back into that circle. Build trust. My parents, you know, when I first was driving and I said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go to the grocery store. Do you guys need anything? They tossed me the keys and they'd give me a list of things. Now, the first time that, you know, that grocery store trip took two and a half hours and I got back. The next time I asked for the keys, they didn't toss them. They climbed in the car with me. And we drove to the grocery store. <laughs> and we drove back home with the groceries that we were supposed to purchase, right? 
So rebuilding trust, and it took a while. It takes just a second to violate trust, but it takes time to rebuild trust and, and to, to get back uh, to where we need to be in relationship. Forgiveness, uh, you know, is, is your part of reconciliation, but building that relationship takes time, and we need to be willing to allow that to happen. I've counseled with some guys who've been unfaithful in their relationships with their wife, and and, and uh, you know, sometimes in just the early stages, it was just flirting or something like that. And, and um, they would come back, you know, weeks later and say, you know, I really ask for forgiveness and I'm not doing anything wrong. You know, I'm, I'm living the way God wants me to live. And yet every time I come home, she wants to look at my phone and she wants to look up through my wallet and she wants to go through my car. And, and I said, you're rebuilding trust, dude. You violated it one time, Right. There'll come a time where she gets tired of looking through the trunk and the, the glove box and everything else, you know, and she's trusting you again. And buddy, you better not violate it twice. But for now, you're rebuilding it. So demonstrate there are three things that are necessary for us to, to rebuild that trust relationship. Okay, this is past forgiveness. You've already forgiven the person. Three things that are needed to rebuild the relationship. Demonstrate genuine repentance. Demonstrate it. Show that you are really sorry about what happened. Make restitution whenever possible. You know, hey, I, you know, thank you for loaning me your lawnmower. It's broke. <laughs> oh, I, I broke it. I'm sorry. Uh, really sorry that happened. You know, please forgive me for that. And pushing it back into their driveway, you know. But uh, <laughs> to do it right, we're going to say, when payday comes, I'm going to buy you another lawnmower. Or I'm going to get it repaired for you. I'm going to fix it, okay? Because I borrowed it. It was on my dime. I'm going to do something to make it right. Rebuild your trust. The third thing is rebuild your trust by proving that he or she has changed over time. Demonstrating. We, we often say to our kids, no one has to tell us that you have changed. Your behavior and your life will tell us that you've changed. I don't, you know, I don't trust people that are talking too much about how much they've changed. I like watching the change in people's lives. Right? You can see it. They don't have to call you and spend an hour on the phone telling you how they've changed. You see it. It's evident in how they are, are reacting and responding. They've changed. And fourth, what forgiveness is not. Forgiveness is not forgetting what happened. A lot of people think that you have to forget. There is a trick that will help you to kind of put those things way back in your mind. And that is don't repeat, rehearse, or relive that, okay? It'll help a lot. But trying to completely forget, you're going to remember these things. You're going to remember what happened. But when you forgive and you let go and you do it as God has done for you, it is, it is not something that you're going to, that's going to raise your blood level, your temperature in your life when you think about that. It is something that you're going to say, thank God I let it go. And I forgave someone and I've gone on with my life. The key to learning to live that way is to see your own self through the eyes of grace. See your mistakes, your flaws, everything that you've done and, and, and try to level the playing field a little bit with everybody else on the planet. And just say, you know... I don't have any right, God, to hold and to harbor uh, anger and hate and, and unforgiveness towards someone else. You have done so much for me. When I look in the mirror of your word, I see all that you've done for me. And I am living a grateful life, a thankful life that you have forgiven me and let those things go. The fifth thing, forgiveness is not my right when I wasn't the one that was hurt. Forgiveness is not my right when I wasn't the one that was hurt. I ran into this several times uh, as a pastor, as a, as a counselor, where people run into the office and they were the victimizers. And they, want to, they want to let me know that they're forgiving the other person. <laughs> right? They're the ones that victimize someone and they're, oh, I just want you to know up front that I've forgiven them, you know. And, uh, you know, they want to take that place. They want to put themselves in the position of the one who was hurt. Now, only the victim has the right to forgive. Only the person who was victimized. You can't forgive people that, you know, you haven't hurt. So 
you know, when, when you have uh, wounded and, and hurt someone, that person who was hurt is the one that can offer forgiveness. They're the ones that can come and release you and let you go from the prison of unforgiveness. They're the ones that have the key that can say, you know, you can come along and, and say, I mistreated you. I did something that was horrible. That can sometimes make it a little easier, but it's on us who have been victimized to, to begin the process and to say, I forgive you. I let you go. I'm not going to hold on to this. The very first kind of giving, giving, was God giving to us. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. When we know what kind of a God he is, it brings and centralizes for us an understanding about giving and it opens a pathway for that. We harbor any kind of unforgiveness and it closes the door to all those wondrous things that God wants to flow through our lives. We've got, we built a dam and it's being stopped by unforgiveness. Now I'm talking to, I want to invite our worship team to come. I'm talking to some today that there is someone in your life that you need to forgive. You need to let go of it. You've been hanging on for a long time and every time that you think that you might arrive at that place, you know, you remember something else or they do something else or whatever. And so you've got this category and you're keeping score and, you know, uh, mentally you've got, you know, uh, it's, it's 86 to nothing, and uh, you're not about to move in the direction of forgiveness. And God's saying, oh, as you keep harboring this, you keep hanging on to this, you're hurting you. You put yourself in a prison. You're the one that is, is moving towards bitterness. You're the one that is, that is entrenching yourself in a place that is so damaging to your own life, personally. God's saying, I want to see you liberated. I've forgiven you. Now I want you to put into action what I gave you. And you know what's wonderful about forgiveness, too? You're like, Pastor, you don't understand the brutality of what took place. We've been seeing in the, the news recently, you know, violations against women that are uh, abhorrent. They're just, just horrible things that take place out of sinful human nature. People taking advantage of someone because they had power, they had authority, whatever kinds of things. And some of you may have been on that end of things where someone with power and authority overpowered you and, and took advantage of you. And God just saying, I don't want you to live in that. I've come to renew you. I've come to forgive you. I've come to heal you. Let's move forward. I've got some wonderful things in store for you. Sin has touched every one of our lives. Don't ever sit in a little corner by yourself and think that you're the only one who has gone through tremendous things. All of us have stories of how hell has reached out and literally grabbed our heart and crushed it. Everybody does because the devil is real to everyone. He is seeking whom he may devour. And everybody in this room has been violated and humans have been the instruments many times of that. But he's told us that there's a spirit behind the humans that's enacting that that's moving people forward in that direction, that they're complicit with it, they're not completely out of the woods, they're guilty in the sense of they're cooperating with those suggestions, with those ideas, with those thoughts. But sin has plagued and captivated humanity and they've touched us all in some way that has damaged us and hurt us. Paul described us as being reeds who are bent in the wind. We don't see life right. We see it crooked. We see things from different perspectives depending on how we're bent. The promise of God is that one day when this life is over in eternity, he's going to take all those bent reeds and straighten them out. And we'll see as we've never seen before. We'll understand as we've never understood before. But he's at this point, he's saying, I want you to trust me. I want you to let go and forgive and not harbor and hang on to. I want to invite you to stand with me. We're going to lead through this first song. Our prayer team is coming. If you want someone to pray with you as you are releasing someone in your life to let them go, to forgive them, we want to do that today. As God has forgiven you, he requires that we forgive others. And it's going to bring radical change, radical change into your life if you do it this morning. 
So I want to invite you to do that as they sing in our prayer team.